backup recording. Ooh, backup. Good point. I hadn't done that. Hang on. Sorry. Give me two shakes. While Peter is getting his backup recording up and running, it might be good for me to quickly explain to the listeners why we have a backup recording. And the, the reason is because unlike video where we can just kind of, when we're putting our own videos out, if we make a mistake, we can just kind of re-edit it, or if something doesn't record, we'll just record it again. But you can't re-record a conversation between two human beings because you can't fake us just having a chat. So we have to have a backup recording just in case the main recording doesn't work for any reason. Because if we record a whole show and then discover that the main recording hasn't worked, trying to redo that show would be almost impossible. Well, you'd literally just have to start again. You'd just have to... Yeah, yeah, but then you'd lose all the element of, like, kind of surprise between us on, on certain topics. Oh, and God, it's Andy. I didn't realise it was Andy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, all that. Exactly. I, I see you've got a new posh uh, stand. I've, I've got a new... Uh, uh, microphone stand and shock mount and all that sort of stuff in a, in a pathetic attempt to try and improve my audio. And I've got blankets. I think I mentioned uh, uh, when we were chatting that I thought my audio was a little bit echoey. I, d- I hadn't noticed, but... Yeah, I hadn't noticed. It was, it was a little bit, you know, a little bit different to what it normally is. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and, uh, and I put all this together, put the microphone back in, had to get a different pop filter to fit the new thing and all that sort of stuff. And... I did a quick test recording, and it was awful. It was absolutely shocking. I've never heard anything so bad. I just couldn't... All I'd done is change the mic stand. That's all I'd... Everything else was identical. Yeah. Uh, and I eventually sort of realised what I'd done. I was actually recording on the, the built-in mic on the computer, not... Oh, no. <laughs> so it defaulted it to the wrong mic. So, yeah, and it was, uh, you know, as soon as I switched that back through to the right uh, input... It was absolutely fine, but uh, yeah, it was just awful, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. Uh, yeah, so always look for the simple solutions, kids. H- have we got matching mic stands now? Then? I think we have his and his, and his mic stands. The uh, the got the road one, the the road studio arm thing. Oh balls! Two seconds. Uh, I've just dropped my backup recording on the floor. Lovely. Has it? Is it still recording? Um. This is how professionals podcast, folks. I was taking my hoodie off and I forgot my, my, my lav mic was attached to my hoodie. Uh, n- nobody's ever done that before, ever. Hello, hello, hello. B- yeah, that's running fine. Cool. <sighs> Good stuff. So, big week. Yes, yes. Where where do we start? Where do we start? Goodness me. Well, let's, let's start with a little bit of unfinished business. Uh, my apologies. I completely uh, neglected to say congratulations on your 20,000 subscribers. Oh, thank you um, very much. It was it was the, at the back of my mind and never made it to the tip of my tongue, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's these things are, you know, they're milestones and, um, you know, need, need to be commented on. So uh, so well done for that. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm not doing a video for this one because it doesn't seem that long ago that I did a video and, pl- and plus... It was all kind of merging in with this two videos a week lark, which is another whole yes. thing. And it was just going to be, oh, well, now I'm going to have to do three videos. And, then, and it was like, oh, just forget it. We'll, we'll, we'll just brush over that one and, and I'll do one for 50 or something. Mm. So in, in other news for the week, on Tuesday in particular, Tuesday was a big day. Uh, I put out two videos in a day, which was uh, unusual for me. Uh, you did one long video a little bit later on. But, of course, the most important news for Tuesday was uh, that last minute of injury time strike by Bobby Firmino, the one-eyed Bobby Firmino, late into injury time uh, to secure a thoroughly deserved win for Liverpool against the, frankly, lacklustre PSG, despite them having a billion, yes, a thousand million pounds worth of players in their squad that they brought to Anfield. Uh, apparently, there were a few other Champions League games on in the week, but uh, yeah, what about them? Don't really care. Uh, that's the football news, Andy, uh, just for you, because I think the rest of the podcast is going to be about you, really, isn't it? Because <laughs> you put out a long, whiny video about how you're not spending enough time with your children and it's all YouTube's fault or something. I did, yeah. Is, is that did. the takeaway from, from the comments? I did. Yeah. I, I, can we yeah. brush back to the football news? Can, can you just explain all of that? Because you are probably my only source of football information. 
that I can then <laughs> pretend that I know the first thing about football when I'm chatting to other people. So Liverpool have have scored a goal. What? Yeah, basically, yeah. They did very well. Uh, okay, champions uh, here in here in Britain we have something called the Premier League, uh, which is where the the top teams play. Hence, hence the name Premier. And the top teams in the Premier League play the Champions League, which is a pan European uh, championship, a knockout championship, a bit like the World Cup, but just for the top European teams. Uh, Liverpool. Uh, 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 are in the Champions League this year on account of how well they did last year. And they played, they're in a very difficult group because they've got, uh, in particular, uh, a, a, a French team called PSG, Paris Saint-Germain. And they have, they, they have uh, their, their front three, their front attacking three players cost more than the whole of Liverpool's entire squad. Basically, they paid uh, in approaching £400 million for these three players. Uh, so yes, Liverpool won a, a deserved victory. Again, it was a fascinating to watch if, if you're interested in football because uh, the Paris Saint Germain players individually were fantastic, but as a team, didn't play well together. They put two goals past Liverpool. To be fair, uh, they they capitalised on a couple of sloppy errors, uh, but uh, a, a, a Brazilian uh, Liverpool striker called Bobby Firmino. Scored a late, uh, late injury time winner, taking us a, a, a deserved three points uh, from that game. I've just noticed the ball you made for the ball without a lathe challenge is behind you on the desk. Uh, I'm glad you were paying attention to the football news. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> you switched off to said after I said somebody scored a goal. Awesome. Right I love that ball. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, but it's yours. I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll glue the bits back on and send it to you. I've, I've got mine in the kitchen, but we've yet to put anything in it. So, yeah, it's been a, a crazy kind of week. Lots happening. And I felt the need to have a bit of a, a YouTube moan i think it's good for the Bit of event good for the soul every now and then and the comments i got back from people because it was one of those videos that i thought this could go either way people could either just think stop whinging and and i get a, a load of negative comments um and i was a little bit worried about that and i have to say the comments i got back from people were just really really touching it just a, a load of uh, more comments than I've ever had for any other video, I think. And just, I would say, all bar one or two, which I'll save for the after show, um, were immensely supportive of my decision not to carry on with two videos a week. Because you, you, can't, you can't hack it, basically. Is that, is that, yeah, yeah. I can't hack it. it. It's just not doable. It, it's with everything else that's going on. It's just, I, I can't do it and um other things are are suffering as a result yeah. and not just online stuff but as i say just family stuff too much stuff is bleeding into the weekend and you know kids coming up to us on a saturday saying oh should we do this dad and it's like oh, i just need to get this video done and it's like oh, and then i have to slap myself in the face yeah. a bit you you got to you got to step back from it if it's if it's taking over to that extent i have to say uh, i started doing two videos a week because the Tuesdays would quick tip type videos. You could, they were the sort of thing that I could put together while I was shooting a longer video, for example. And they've sort of expanded into being longer videos in themselves now. But I have absolutely no problem with putting out a, a 90 second video on a Tuesday. Uh, if, if, that's, if that's what I got, that's what you get. I think, uh, and my main kind of takeaway or the, or the point that I was trying to get across in the, in the video is that if I don't put out a video on a particular week when you're expecting it, then I think I'm just removing the self-imposed deadline. Mm. Because the the two video a week thing is it's me who's come up with that. <laughs> it's not anyone else. It's absolutely. It's a. It's a. You know. I'm. I'm sure this came up in the comments as well. It's a. It's a self-inflicted. Uh, it's a self-imposed yeah. deadline. It's. It's entirely on you. What, what we do, what we what exactly, we and I've got that as I say about five year window at the minute where my kids are at that age before they potentially or, or the first one potentially leaves home and, and goes off and does their own thing. Yep, and time is just passing too quick for a YouTube algorithm to be 
dictating what I'm doing. Absolutely. Uh, how, what's the difference in age between your kids at four years, five? Uh, f- four years, yeah. So m- my youngest's uh, eight, coming on nine. Uh, well, it's about three and a half years, and my, my eldest's uh, 12. So they're, they're at that kind of lovely age that you just want to lock them at that age. Absolutely. Uh, but as soon as they become teenagers, you're just a wallet with car keys attached yes. basically for, for, a, for a certain period. Uh, and they won't, won't want to be with you or around you because you're just some old guy who knows nothing. And uh, they, they come back. But um, Yeah. So, um, so yes, as I say, the, the comments I got back were really heartfelt and supporting and uh, much appreciated. And it just takes the pressure off a bit. And as I say, there's a lot of other things that I'm trying to do at the moment anyway. Well, yes. I mean, you, I think you ended that video by saying uh, you actually started another channel, haven't you? Yeah, and that actually kind of vaguely links on to one of the things that we'll be talking about today. But okay. um, yeah, so there's a, yet another channel. Beauty tips and do a get ready with me in the morning. Or... Well, it's either that or cats and cucumbers, dedicated cats and cucumbers video. Yeah, I, I've never seen a cat and cucumber video, I've got to say. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I've got to go and look those up. They're brilliant. No, what am I saying? <laughs> so, and what have you been up to this week? This week, well, I, I you know, I, this week I will have put out five, count them, five videos. That's crazy. On YouTube, not including the, the little bits and pieces that I've done on Instagram and, and all the other things. Uh, but I've been working, I've got a, a build going through, and I've been sort of, you know, grappling with the YouTube stuff myself. There's, there's trying to build up that sort of back catalogue for the next few weeks because I know I've got a couple of bigger projects coming through, lots of painted stuff. Um, so the studio is that the studio, <laughs> the, the workshop is going to be quite tied up with uh, uh, big painted projects and things, so I won't be able to do much else around them. So I need to, you know, get a few videos in the can and uh, get, a, get a little library together together. Uh, so that I can put those out. So that's what I've been doing this week, and and of course playing with my uh, with my new uh, air scrubber thing. Yes, I, I enjoyed that video. I thought that was very interesting. Did you get well? Keep the silly comments for for the after show, but <laughs> I'm assuming uh, you got your fair share. Uh, they were generally pretty solid, actually. The the comments, uh, many of them along the lines of "Wow, that's loud." And hence the the second video to show that it really isn't that loud. Uh, it was just the way I was. I was. You know, I don't want to misrepresent anything. It is louder than I was expecting, but it wasn't as loud as I as it appeared in the in the first video, just because of where the microphone was. I've started putting a mic on a boom. Um, I've tried uh, using a, a lav mic, a level of lapel mic, uh, on a couple of vids, and although it works well. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with my asthma medication at the minute, which is why I sound a little bit wheezy, a little bit croaky sometimes. And having a, a mic on your chest, <laughs> catching every breath is not a great, uh, unless I can go through and, you know, do a, a, a noise reduction on, on every intake of breath. It's not, uh, it's not fantastic. Uh, there's, there's lots of benefits in having a lav mic uh, if you are talking and you turn away from camera uh, momentarily. It, it, you know, the the volume doesn't change, um, but actually, I actually prefer the the sound. I prefer the quality of sound that I get from a from a boomed uh, little shotgun mic. I did get a, I did get a, a, a couple of comments in one of my videos this week about the podcast uh, to say any plans to do a video version, and I said no, uh, no. Uh, it's we're, we're still working on trying to get the, the audio one <laughs> to a reasonably regular level. I've seen podcasts where the two people are in the same room and that can work well as a video podcast because you don't have any delay or anything like that to, to worry about. But I haven't seen that many video podcasts where they're in two different places. Um, well, uh, old Leo Laporte over at Twit TV, This Week in Tech, does a lot of video podcasts, but he's got, a, you know, multi-million dollar studio set up with you know fake fake backgrounds and, and all the rest of it it's uh, you know people on different screens and you switch between the the three or the four guests who are all in different places it's uh, it takes a lot of work and he has a big production team behind him as well rather than you know two blokes with their phones like us you know yeah 
I mean, I don't. I've I've never counted how many edits there are in a in a typical podcast. Yeah, don't um, don't do that. You just depress yourself. <laughs> but there, there's a lot, and then to try and put that into video form would be yeah. it would take forever. It, it turned out that the the comment that I had was actually because the guy wanted to leave a comment, uh, but couldn't. Let's say he couldn't figure out how to how to leave them <laughs> oh, okay, through Twitter okay, okay. or Instagram. So I, I pointed him to the, uh, the the measuring up YouTube stream and just said, you know, we don't, we don't generally respond to comments. We we look at them, we view them, but we don't respond to them there. Yeah, if- I've had a few emails this week actually from people who who've said that they couldn't figure out how to get uh, how to contact us. Uh, uh, of course, the best way is uh, through Twitter, uh, measuring up PC on Twitter or, or Instagram at Measuring Up Podcast, uh, or email, of course, uh, contact at Measuring Up Podcast will always find us. All of these uh, methods of, of getting hold of us are in the show notes of every episode of the podcast and also on the website, uh, measuringuppodcast.com as well. So uh, no excuses. Uh, get hold of us uh, any way you can. We'll love hearing from you. Uh, we've had a few a few people get in touch uh, over the uh, over the last couple of weeks as well, haven't we? Yes, we've had um, some quite interesting questions come up over the last uh, couple of weeks. And one of the things that came up, we might as well dive straight into it. Or oh, do you want to do your f- follow-up quickly? Oh, I forgot about that. Ooh, yeah, good point. Good point. Famous people. Yes, I, uh, I had completely forgotten. We, we talked about, you know, chatted about whether or not we'd, we'd worked for famous people. I've forgotten about it again, you see. This is obviously <laughs> of, of no account. Um, I... I uh, I had completely forgotten, and uh, I only was reminded because they got hold of me again because uh, they want me to go and do some more work. I, I have actually mem- worked for a member of the Queen's household, so not for her Madge herself, uh, but one of her staff at uh, at a palace. I can't say, probably can't say which one. It's a palace near nearest to me, let's say. So you did the work at the palace? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's quite a good one. Yeah, you've got to be vetted. I'm not sure if you do the full... Official Secret Act. Uh, I had to sign a thing to say, you know, if I end up in the tower, I want fresh towels every day. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, it was really interesting, <laughs> literally, to go through the tradesman's entrance uh, to uh, t- to that particular palace and to take a look inside. Um, yeah, uh, fascinating, fascinating insight into that world as well. It's not, you know, like most people, it's not something we're party to, and. I haven't asked whether they should, whether they'd be happy me, with me talking about it. So uh, I, w- I just won't. Uh, but it, it's a, a what they call a you know a grace and favour apartment. So it comes with the job. But what I hadn't realised was that because these people work for the Queen, when the Queen goes, whether she passes away or abdicates or whatever else passes the the reins the the mantle onto Charles or whoever. Uh, all those people who work for her are out of a job, and they're not—they're not just out of a job; they're out of, out of a home as well. Really? Does it not just carry forward? No, that's amazing. No, I didn't realize whoever that. the incoming is will have their own people. Ah, right. Now, right. maybe if they're in a position of whatever, their their work and their uh, and their grace and favor apartment will continue. But uh, no, it's 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 secure as long as the monarch is still breathing or still in her job. Wow, I didn't realise that. Finishes. that. Yeah, I I didn't either. It's quite a quite an eye opener actually. I mean, a you know, fantastic place to live. Yeah, um, <laughs> very central, close to all <laughs> amenities. Yes, excellent security. <laughs> um, wow. Well, well, that's yeah. That'll take some topping. Mm. So yes, anyway, there we are. Yeah, I, I had completely forgotten about that, and uh, my apologies, Your Majesty. I hadn't actually, I haven't actually worked for the Queen, but I have worked for a member of her household uh, at a, at a palace near me, and uh, which was interesting actually uh, to see inside the palace because it's it's almost exactly as you'd imagine. Uh, obviously, very old. Uh, this particular house is uh, from the 1600s uh, and was bought as a country home uh, for the. Again, I can't. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it, it's old flagstone stores on the whole of the ground floor, so they could sort of herd the cattle through or the horses or whatever it was. Uh, but the rest of it is is almost exactly as you'd imagine, 
good quality but all a bit worn all a little bit threadbare and things get replaced when they need to there's nothing sort of cosmetic -y about it so yeah interesting very interesting so does this mean that you can have like the royal seal of approval and you can you you can put the stamp on your letterhead to say officially commissioned by her majesty the queen no unfortunately not uh, i i i haven't I haven't worked directly for for her Madge, so uh, for a monarch, so no, I don't, uh, I don't get that. Uh, I wonder how you get that uh, that benefit now. Uh, I think you have to do, you know, the, the approved carpet fitter to the Queen or something. I think, uh, but yes, a fascinating little insight to uh, to that world. It's not somewhere I really, you know, uh, it's not somewhere that that most people know much about, and uh, really interesting to have a little a little peek. So. We had uh, another bit of follow-up, where well, two bits of follow-up. We'll cover kind of the the briefer one first. And I'm not going to mention the person's name because I don't want to embarrass him. But he basically said, have you got any tips for finding work? He's got a Facebook page and an Instagram page and tons of positive reviews from customers all over the net. Um, not had a single job going on for six weeks and is hardly getting any calls um, and is getting tempted to just jack the whole lot in and go to um, corporate work or, or whatever. And he loves the podcast and he listens to podcasts while he's on site doing work or on site doing no work, as the case may be. Yeah. And um, it's tough times when you when you go through phases like that. Mm. And I, I think... It's worth saying we've we've all had phases like that. We've all had, you know, we all get the odd week and maybe the odd fortnight where it just dies, and that's usually a relief because it means you can clear the workshop out. And over over time, I've certainly I don't know about you, Andy, but I've certainly learned to enjoy those periods because you, you know Absolutely. it's not going to last. But when yeah. it gets to a month or six weeks, then it can get a bit. You know, you've tidied the workshop. You've reorganized your website you've done all that other stuff what do you do next well and this is the thing i had a quick look into um his business mm. and yes he's got a facebook page and there's an instagram page but the instagram page hasn't had that much posted to it to be honest but he doesn't have a website oh okay and i would say that is your problem um you you've got to have a, a, a website these days yeah if if I'm booking anyone for a job, whether I book them through Facebook or Instagram or even Twitter or, you know, however I get hold of them. Yep. The first thing I do is go to their website to have a look at what they do. And if they don't have a website, that is a major put off for me. Yeah, absolutely. So I would certainly say, you know, get yourself onto any proper like website provider. And be effectively what he's doing is using his Facebook page as his website. Mm. And yeah, that that I think that's a huge mistake. I've got to say, um, I, I'm I'm not a Facebook user. I don't really understand it. I have an uh, an account and I keep an eye on a couple of Facebook groups, but that's that's all I do. I don't really post to it at all. So anybody looking me up on Facebook will probably go away scratching their heads, wondering what's going on. I know Facebook are trying to position themselves as the only site you need. Who needs a website when you can have Facebook pages and all that? But an awful lot of people aren't on Facebook. I, I would probably say the vast majority aren't on Facebook. Yeah, just despite what Facebook might tell you. And if you're on Facebook, you might think that everybody's there, but an awful lot of people aren't. And I, I would say uh, just a simple scrolling page website with some samples of your, of your work, decent photography, uh, good references, put them in quotes, put them in a box, there are so many website builder companies around there now. Even even a Google, you know, free website through through Google uh, is is better than nothing. But you can do much much better from you know, all all the usual suspects. That I'm not sure that any one is any better than the others. But uh, yeah, so I would certainly say to him. Um, get yourself a website sorted out. Get on Wix.com or Squarespace or, or you know any of the free. Like, uh, well, I don't know if they're all completely free. Yeah, Square Squarespace isn't, but Wix and Weebly and all those usual suspects are. They they give you a free version, and the free version will have this website provided by 
Wix or Weebly or whoever along the bottom of it, and so what? You know, that, that doesn't matter. And Or even, you know, and Squarespace isn't expensive, so if, if you wanted to pay for, for something, you know, and we're not going to turn it into a, a, a free sponsorship for them, but, you know, there's plenty of options out there for um, either free or a nominal charge to get yourself a, a website up and running, and you need to sort that. I would put that as top of your list. Yeah. The other thing... Um, you mentioned that you've got an Instagram page, but I had a quick look at your Instagram page and there's not enough content on it. You, you've you got a bunch of posts from kind of back in July and there's nothing since. And you, really, for Instagram to be of any worth, you've got to be posting every day to two days, I would say. If, you post, if you're posting any less frequently than that, your Instagram thing, you might as well just not bother doing it because it'll not grow at all we we've both started posting to instagram more regularly i've, I've noticed you popping up more and i'm i'm trying to post daily and it it does generate views and likes and followers it really does but but if you don't do that it's it's even worse than doing nothing because you just have static images sat there that aren't getting any attention and and you can tell that they're from you know months ago whereas if you put those images on a website there's no time context to them there you know i I haven't touched my website for a year probably which is a a terrible thing to admit uh, in terms of the pictures and and i know i do need to do something about that and i will when i have this mythical time (laughs) at some point but uh you know what 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 difference does it make the pictures are there they look great uh, and they're representative of the work I did at that time. Nobody knows that those are from, you know, six months or a year ago. Whereas something posted to Facebook uh, or Instagram is, will always be have a time context to it. So yeah, very important to to, to if you are going to use Instagram or Facebook in that way, you need to post regularly. Uh, and much better to have a a, a simple static website uh, to to as a repository for all those sort of uh, all those pictures and all those reviews definitely and and yeah. i would say if you do want to do the instagram thing because i think instagram's in a, one of the best and underused business tools at the moment i would rate instagram way above facebook at at the moment um people are coming off facebook in in droves at the moment but um people are still uh, I think numbers are increasing on Instagram and certainly from a small business perspective, it can be a, a very, very powerful tool. And all I would do is go through all of your jobs, you know, spend half a day, go through every picture of every job you've ever done and try and build up a library of maybe 150 pictures. Get them all looking as nice as you can get them. Don't go overkill, but just try and build up 150 pictures shove them on your phone, do an update every two days, and there you go. You've got a year's worth of updates ready for, for Instagram, and you don't, have to think, you don't have to think about it again. Every couple of days, just shove another picture on, tag it appropriately, make sure you've got proper hashtags on that kind of summarise what the jobs are. Yeah, good idea. You know, have a look at what your competitors are doing on Instagram like or, or successful businesses who are similar to yours. Have a look at the types of posts that they're doing and you know, emulate what they're they're doing. Don't copy it word for word, but look at what they're doing that that works. Um, you know, how long are the posts? What are they talking about? What sort of tags are they using? And um, yeah, if if you want to build up Instagram, I would say as a bare minimum, there's a good starting point. Yeah, that that's a, an excellent idea. I'm going to make notes here myself. Uh, I, I would say though. When it comes to your website, take those 150 pictures and and edit those really brutally so you get the best two or three of each type of work that you want to represent. So if you do alcove units, just have two or three of the best. If you do fitted wardrobes, just have two or three of the best. By all means, have a little detailed shot of a hinge or a handle that you're particularly proud of, but just stick to doing the absolute best of your work uh, on that website because then it'll it'll stay around and it'll still look good. doesn't matter if it's six months or a year, or a year old. 
it'll still look good because they're they're your best work. They're your best yeah, pictures. Exactly. And you know, this is where your showcase jobs come in. You know, you, you sometimes get a job that comes about which you're happy to do it at um you know, you're happy to take compromises on how much reward you're gonna get from the job because you can use that as a portfolio job for, fu- yeah, for, for portfolio future. Portfolio job, stuff. absolutely. And you know, those sort of jobs take the very best pictures that you can possibly take once the job's finished. Um, obviously ask the client's permission, maybe try and get the client to dress everything after you've gone away and send you some pictures that they would be happy for you to use. And, you know, you only need a handful of those kind of portfolio-type jobs. I don't know if you do this, Andy, but what I generally tend to do is book in a revisit every kind of six six weeks to two months, six to eight weeks after the install, just to go back and make sure that the doors haven't settled slightly on the hinges or anything, just to make sure that everything's, you know, once they, they load it up with all their books or whatever else, nothing sagging and, you know, just to make sure that everything's still looking nice. It's a good way to reconnect with a client and and it's a good opportunity with the piece of furniture dressed appropriately uh, to take a couple of quick pictures for yourself with their permission, of course. Uh, things you, things you want to want to watch out for in particular are children's photographs. Take kids' pictures off because uh, no nobody would want their their kids' pictures on somebody's website. Uh, I mean, I just normally blur them in in Photoshop yeah, and make yeah, sure there's course. no we just blur any faces out so that you're not showing any personal information you know if if you've taken photographs of a, a a storage cupboard and it's full of that person's files make sure you can't read what's Absolutely, written on any yeah. of the, the files and things you know just blur out personal information but yeah it, it's a really good thing i don't do that and i should do that the the follow-up thing because as you say at, at the moment basically I, I say to customers if you've got any problems whatsoever get in touch i'll come back over for free to sort it out it's a it's a really good way to reconnect with the customer as well because then it puts you in the in the front of their mind again first of all it, it looks like you care and we do obviously uh, but it also gives them a chance to think oh well andy's coming back in six weeks i'll have a chat with him about that other bookcase i wanted to talk about so you know it, it's a it's a it's a good way to not to upsell people but to, to reconnect with people uh, and to discuss, you know, future projects with them. It's a great idea. Great idea. What, what about uh, what about location as well? Because obviously, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that I live in London, that I could start my business with nothing but a mobile phone because of the, the density of, of people here. There are costs attached to that, not just financial. Uh, if you're in a uh, less economically stable area how would you go about finding work personally what i would do and again where i am in in like the gothworth area of newcastle's quite an affluent area of newcastle and there seems to be no shortage of work ar- around here and the, the surrounding areas but I, this is where facebook comes into its own and this is where you should use facebook because you can geographically target your advertising to Anyway, you can literally, I'm sure you can draw a shape on a map and say, I just want to target that housing estate. You know, if not, you can certainly do it by a um, a radius from a, a postcode or something. And I would target all of the affluent areas, even if you have to drive a little bit further, target all of the affluent areas where they've got money to spend on the sort of work that you want to do. And if you're happy to cover that distance, run a couple of boosted Facebook adverts to those areas where you're going to make more money from the jobs because at the end of the day if you're in an area where people don't have the money to spend on what you do then there is no market yeah so you've got to go to where the work is you know this this is basic economics to it to an extent I'm, I'm very fortunate that there's an awful lot of work on my doorstep because of where i live uh but no matter where you live if it's a an economically depressed area there will be areas within striking distance where the bankers and the lawyers and the doctors and the dentists and all the professions with money to spend will live, target them. As much as I hate Facebook, well, I don't, I don't hate Facebook, but as much as um, 
I despise, no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Dislike. As much as I don't use Facebook, as much as I used to use it, um, this is where it really comes into its own. No, There's no other platform on the planet that I'm aware of that you can target to that degree. You know, you can target to the point of, um, you know, demographics on, on age group. You know, you, you might be looking to just target people who are looking to do huge extensions on, on a house. So you're not going to be targeting 18 to 24 year olds, you know, yeah, so yeah. you might as well just knock them out the equation, Absolutely. you know, target your, your um, probably 30 to 30 to 50 year olds, maybe 30 to 60 year olds, go for the area that are, are likely to be doing that sort of work. Um, you, you can even go down to their dislikes and likes, you know, you, you can say, do, you know, yeah. do they like uh, certain things that might be a trigger point for something that you sell. Um, so there's so it, it's so powerful in that respect. It, it's scary, but mm. uh, I, I would certainly make use of, of that, especially if you've already got a good yeah. Facebook following. But you would have to pay to to do that. But it's it's not a huge amount. Yes, there, there's a cost attached to that. Obviously, um, the other thing you can do, and, and that I did when I was doing the handyman type work, is again fairly easy for me because I just have a walk around the streets, but have a drive around these areas and see if there's bigger building type projects going on. If somebody looks like they're having an extension built or a loft conversion done or whatever else, literally drop them a line, make a note of the address and you know, you can find out through the electoral poll who lives there, send them a letter with a little, you know, A4 folded leaflet saying, I make fitted furniture. I, I happen to see you're having an extension built. I specialize in fitted furniture, bookcases, wardrobes, you know, storage, kitchen stuff, whatever it is, if I can be of any help once the uh, once the, the building work is finished, please let me know. I, I picked up a couple of jobs through doing that, uh, just, by, just by keeping your eyes peeled and uh, and being a little bit more proactive about yeah, it. absolutely. You know, target new build housing estates. You know, if you do, I noticed on, on his Facebook that he seems to do decking and all that sort of thing. Well, okay, if you go to an estate with 2,000 brand new houses, you're going to have 2,000 people looking for decking or, or looking for getting something done in their garden, you know. So, you know, target target that sort of thing. There's, there's, just think of it a little bit differently, perhaps from the conventional way th that you've done things to date. But your, your hub, absolutely, before you do anything else, get a website because otherwise... Every single person or a large proportion of every lead you're going to get is going to go looking for that website. They can't find it and they'll just think, oh, I'll go somewhere else. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and if they're not a Facebook user or an Instagram user, and so many people aren't, then they're, they'll, it's too much effort. And it, it really is. Uh, a simple scrolling web page is your color catalog to the world and it, it it can be so cheap to put together and so easy and so effective uh, you absolutely need to get that done uh, so i hope that helps uh, yeah it's it's a tough one it's and i think we've all been there to an extent andy where you know you get into this horrible sort of funk where it's hard to get going it's hard to get motivated when you have no work and you just see you know and you've had no work for a while you just see no work stretching out ahead of you like that and it's it's hard to get going but you you must you got to keep on keeping on and uh, this is your perfect time for doing this sort of work because you'll not do it when you're busy no exactly exactly well first let me tell you about somebody awesome this week's episode is sponsored by ooze nest you know ooze nest i used their v slot 2040 aluminium extrusion in a recent video a ooze nest can supply from stock a wide range of shapes and sizes or precision cut to your needs. Ooze Nest also has a huge stock of connectors and bearings, bolts and screws, mounts and brackets, shims and spacers, all the handy-dandy little bits and pieces that you might need for your next project. Now with all this hardware to hand, you won't be shocked to learn that Ooze Nest are also deeply involved in CNC machining. They can supply you with anything from a handful of parts to a full CNC kit, with everything you need to get up and running. So if you've had your CNC interest tickled by all those YouTube videos, but are finding the process of discovering exactly what you need all a bit opaque, well, with a desktop kit starting at a lot less than you might think, you should definitely be paying Ooze Nest a visit. Ooze Nest is a young British company that ships worldwide, 
And if you order before 1pm, you'll have same-day dispatch from stock items. Better still, when you use the offer code MEASUREUP, or one word, MEASUREUP, at checkout, you'll receive a 5% discount off your first order. A 5% discount and same-day dispatch. What's not to like? Pay Oosnest a visit at oosnest.co.uk or use the links in the show notes or on our website. And we'd like to thank Oosnest for their support of this show. Absolutely awesome. I've been getting my small business toolbox, a uh, new YouTube channel up and running. And the basically, in a, in a very, very briefly, I had my Andy Mac Drums YouTube channel, which was just a whole load of random drum stuff. And uh, about four or so years ago, I put together a, a very random video of me uh, sorting out my tax and accounts. Just does not get any better than that, does it? Okay, just completely randomly. I mean, to be fair, that YouTube channel has been my proving ground for a, a lot of different stuff. My my first ever kind of DIY making type video was on that channel as well, and that's where the Guffith Handyman channel came from, right? which is th- those videos ended up being more popular than any of the videos that I did about drumming. Fascinating. So, so, uh, You'd have thought, you know. Yeah, so I did this video about tax and, and keeping records and all that sort of thing. I, re- I remember you saying, actually, when, when we were chatting early on in the uh, in the first season that you'd done a, a tax return video, which was extremely popular. It, well, in the scheme of things, it was extremely popular. It, it was more pop. It was your number one on YouTube for if you searched for tax in the UK, you know. Right. It, but you were competing with the HMRC, which had had like 2,000 views on their video, which yeah, people don't really search for tax videos on YouTube. But people liked my video, and as a result, I ended up doing more and more small business tips. And eventually it was like, hold on, I've got all of these small business tips on a channel called Andy Mac Drums. Mm. This is getting very confusing. Um, and plus, it was a channel that was still full of drum videos. Right. So it was causing the YouTube algorithm no ends of pain trying to work out what on earth this channel was yeah, about. You, you you draw a Venn diagram between drumming and tax returns, and the crossover point is going to be pretty small, isn't it's it? It's very <laughs> small, yeah. So eventually, four years down the line, I finally set up a brand new channel called The Small Business Toolbox. I'll include a link in the description. Woohoo! Um, and if anyone wants to follow that channel, then please feel free to go on there. The, I'm just starting to get content migrated over from the Andy Mac Drums channel onto this channel, which means I'm rebranding everything to the new thing, uh, re-editing everything. Right. And um, obviously I lose all my views and comments and everything. So I'm, I'm losing best part of... 200,000 views, maybe more, probably coming on for a quarter of a million views that I'm losing by doing this, but I think it's the right decision. I don't, th- I can't, th- I've been mulling it over for a long time and I can't think of another way of, of doing this. I've got to get them off that channel and onto a new channel and there's no way of moving videos on YouTube. All you can do is... Yeah, you, you can't migrate them. They, you actually have to move them. And by the way, oh, the chicken and egg situation of trying to do this, because the thing I'm worried about now is what happens if my video is on two different channels at the same time? Is that going to give me a, Ooh. is that going to give me a, a copyright strike? So I'm having to be very yeah, careful. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. So I'm going to make sure I've deleted it off one channel before I upload it to the new channel. But obviously and that all needs to be timed correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah. If if our listeners aren't aware, you can't have duplicate videos on YouTube. Um, as I discovered this week when my I put a video up on Tuesday, scheduled to go out at midday, and although it, it's scheduled, it it was visible through the link, but it didn't appear on my video page. So I put the video out, and I got sort of three views in the first half an hour. I thought, eh, something not quite right there. So I had to take it down and, and re-up it. But I had to actually take it down. I had to delete it before I could re-upload the new one, uh, and and that went fine. So uh, it was one of those weird, oddball, sort of glitchy type things. But, uh, yeah, you can't have duplicates, which is a real pain. Yeah, so you do have to be careful with that sort of thing because um, the, there's all, sort of, all sorts of content ID matching and things that YouTube can do. That's right. Well, they, they, they literally, you know, scan the, the bytes of the code of the upload, and if it's identical to another one, it wags the finger at you and says, no, can't do that. Which makes it difficult for us if we wanted to do uh, 
uh, time released content for our Patreon supporters, for example. You can't. You've got to do two separate videos that are slightly different. It's a, it's a whole mess, basically. It, it's uh, tricky. Anyway. So yeah, the timing of all that's been been a challenge, but. I've been kind of getting stuff gradually sorted out in the background, and and hopefully that'll be up and run. But but it's up and running now, and uh, uh, well, there's no content on the channel yet, but the the will be hope, well, there will be by the time this podcast comes out. So, uh, uh, but I'm up. I'm not uploading it all in one go. I'm kind of doing it staged because of this um, potential problem for copyright yeah, strikes sure. between two of my own channels so so i'm just having i'm doing it one video at a time one every week taking it off one channel giving it a day or so to realize that the video is gone uploading it to the new channel see how it goes leave it for a week do the next one and i'm and i've got about 10 or so videos that i need to do that with and then i can get around to putting some actual new content on which will be oh, quite no. exciting yeah but it's great. painful deleting a video when you know it's got the top keyword search term for a really good word. Like, literally, one of them, it, it's got number one for the word tax return yeah. for the for the whole of YouTube, and I'm having to delete that. And, and that that's uh, – hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll pick it up again, but it, it may not. We'll, we'll see what happens. So – how did I get onto that? Um, yeah, you you were doing a, a a plug for your own channel, but there we are. Yeah, yeah, but it was relating to time management. That was it. I did a video about time management, which will appear on that channel at some point, and it was all about me having a cold and not being in a fit state of mind or anything to do any form of woodwork. Uh, on that particular day. Right. And instead of doing woodwork, I decided to spend some time looking at my YouTube stats. And this was uh, a couple of years ago. And um, as a result, the Gosforth Handyman YouTube channel was born. Right. And if I hadn't... Well, the, the channel already existed, but I ended up putting content out more regularly and, and stuff and really focusing on that channel more. Uh-huh. And if it wasn't for me having a day of downtime, and this is where I'm saying it's so important to do this while you've got nothing else on, Mm. make good use of that because some of the best decisions I've had have been as a result of these days where you can't do anything else. So anyway, that that was kind of my point in a roundabout kind of way. Mm. Record keeping. Let's talk about tax. We've got, we're we're at, uh, yeah. Ten minutes. In a nutshell, well, how do you, Keep records. What do, what do you do for, uh, presumably for your accountant? Um, you're a you're a sole trader. You you uh, you're self employed by the true nature of the word. I am indeed a sole trader. Yep, yeah. I employ myself. And um, you presumably keep records and you invoice people and and all that sort of thing. I do. How how do you manage your paperwork? ready for end of year when you have to hand everything over to the accountant? I have a shoebox and I put everything in the shoebox and once a year when I really, really have to, I take a look at it and sort it out. Uh, I I hate the whole record-keeping businessy side of the business. I hate it. I am, I am not naturally one of life's self-employed people. It was sort of thrust upon me at an early age and I, I find it irksome and irritating my accountants, uh, who I took on when I was very young, have grown massively, and they do big boys accounting now, basically. Uh, so, so I get big boys accounts done for a, what is essentially a very small business. Um, but as a, as a self-employed sole trader... It's important to uh, what, what I did when I started. Uh, you split out your business and your personal bank accounts. Have a business bank account. Keep the keep the two sets of expenses separate. Even as a self-employed sole trader, you could say, "Well, it's all one big pot of money, and it's all mine anyway, uh, and I can sort it out later." It's much easier to keep them separate. There'll be some costs attached to that. That's their business expenses. They are 100% tax deductible. Um, so keep those separate. Early on, I'd say you need to think about getting a bookkeeper or not. 
Uh, I kind of wish I did because, again, I find that minutiae uh, really tedious and not remotely interesting or relevant, really. Uh, so, again, a bookkeeper would be a regular expense. And if you're just starting out, uh, it might be an expense too far. I, I just couldn't find anybody when I was starting out as self-employed to do to do my sort of books. And to be honest, the books are, back then were very simple. They're not much more complicated now. Uh, but an accountant is well worth having. And any accountant that's worth their salt will give you a half an hour of their time for free when you're first setting up to just to give you a bit of you know, broad strokes advice uh, if an accountant won't give you that, then they're probably not for you. So in terms of, of record keeping, I uh, I have a spreadsheet. Uh, uh, again, this is a whole other topic. You know, do you have accountancy type software uh, to do it or, or do you do it a homebrew version uh, on a spreadsheet? I, I went the spreadsheet version. Uh, it's uh, unnecessarily complex, to be honest, but it does the job reasonably well every time every year that i do it i look at it and think there must be an easier way of this and every time i look at it i come to the conclusion that actually what i've got is probably it works pretty well and i'm not going to be doing it for that much longer so i'm just leaving it i did put in place a separate invoicing package which i'm now trying to step away from and you know with a certain sense of irony, I have to upgrade to the pro version of the invoicing package in order to get my data out of it. So if you do go in for one of these packages, be sure that you have easy access to get your data out of the out of the package to use elsewhere. So yeah, it's one of those sort of niggles. Um, but generally speaking, again, Probably like you, Andy, the, the business itself is very simple. Uh, I don't produce anything like as many invoices as I did when I was doing the handyman type stuff. It's not unusual for me to produce one or two invoices a month these days, obviously for rather more money than when I was doing handyman type stuff. So the the record keeping, the, the bookkeeping side of it shouldn't be that complicated. And, and for me, it isn't. So uh, spreadsheet, I keep all my... I call them receipts. My accountants insist on calling them purchase invoices. Uh, I keep those in a, a, a metaphorical shoebox and I go through them. I know I should do it every quarter like I did when I was VAT registered, but now I'm not. I actually do it once a year and it takes me a couple of days and I just accept that uh, to, to sort those out onto what categories of expense they are. Um, and, and that's kind of it. You know, I know through my online bank account, how much money has moved through the account during that year because it's totally separate from my personal account. Uh, it, it's not an onerous task to, to marry those two up and, uh, and to produce a, a very simple set of figures that then my accountants can sort of weave their magic on. I produce a, a simple profit and loss every year, which I'm sure you probably do something similar. You, you take your income, your fees invoiced, and any other income received, you take off the cost of sales, which is materials and supplies, and then you take off your expenses, whether that's your know, use of home, print post and so. I mean, accountants love columns. They love sort of lots and lots of columns and sub columns. And, you know, when, when I was VAT registered, I had to split out petrol expenses from motor expenses because one was VATable and one wasn't. Um, when I worked, in fact, when I was uh, a photographer's assistant, during one of the inevitable VAT inspections, uh, we, we would buy uh, biscuits for the studio for clients to use. And there was a big debate as to whether they could claim back the VAT on them. And it, it came down to chocolate biscuits are a luxury item, so you cannot claim the VAT back on them. But ordinary biscuits were not a luxury item, so you could claim the VAT on them. I mean, this kind of stupid nonsense gets on my wick it really does so there was the whole thing of whether a jaffa cake is a biscuit or a cake absolutely and and it's like one of them is fatable and one of them isn't and there was a whole battle about whether jaffa cakes are yep um, so <laughs> Crazy. I, I stay away from as much of that stuff as possible 
Uh, I, I'm sure other people have far, far better ways of, of dealing with all this. But I basically put everything into a file more or less in order as it comes in. And once a year, I take that out and go through it. It takes me a couple of days. I hate those couple of days, but I feel good at the end of it. And after that, I can send copies of my bank statements, my my um, reconciliation uh, to the accountants, and they can say, ah, well, you know, you need to allow for depreciation on this, that, and the other, annotation on this and that, uh, and here's how much the taxman owes you. Because I because I don't make any money basically <laughs> since I've been YouTube and and this is <laughs> this is one of the key points as well of uh, you know should you bother getting an accountant and almost every time I've had an accountant do work for me they've saved me more money than they've yes, cost me every time o- almost fail. every time I would say yep. um, I mean my company structure is a little bit different to yours yes because you've got limited companies and things as well yeah so my joinery business is a limited company. Um, which is mainly because I do quite a lot of commercial work and there's a couple of commercial entities that I've done work for that will only deal with limited companies. Right. Um, and plus, um, it just gives me a little bit more confidence to do bigger commercial jobs that I would be a little bit wary about doing. As a self-employed sole trader. As a self-employed person. It just it puts that kind of comfort blanket around and keeps it yeah. as an isolated entity. Um, and... But it's essentially the same thing. The 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 records. Um, sorry, it's not the same thing. A limited company is very very different. Just to get get across, very different. Yeah, yeah. But the record keeping is almost exactly the same. Um, I keep all my receipts, um, and I, I'm probably. A, I I don't mind the record keeping side as much, but I still despise it. I don't think I despise it quite as much as you despise it. Yeah, um, it's it's hatred for me. When, yeah, when yeah. I have it all up to date, I feel great, and it's like yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. At the end of it, it's fine, but it's two days of yeah. misery. And every time I ha- actually no, it's not. It's not even misery. It's two days of drudgery. It is. It's just I don't want to do it I, again. If you're starting out, seriously, look at getting a bookkeeper. They they won't cost you much. Uh, if, if your books are relatively simple, you know, twenty or thirty quid a month, probably an hour of somebody's time will cover that cost. Uh, would would cover your bookkeeping for a, for a bookkeeping for a simple uh, one man band sole trading yeah. business, and uh, I I wish I'd found somebody when I was starting out because then I wouldn't have this kind of hands on element to it. Uh, yeah, yeah, there yeah. You go. But all I do, I I keep everything in a folder, all the receipts, and periodically. Um, I try to delve through it, and uh, all the loose receipts get sellotaped onto piece of, pieces of A4 paper mm. and numbered so that they're not just flapping about and I can refer to them yeah. and it just makes it a bit easier for the next stage, which is then typing them all into a spreadsheet yep. and numbering them all and being able to refer to them um, because I've been through tax audits. I've been through pretty much every type of tax audit. I've, um, have I had a couple? I uh, can't remember if I've had a corporation tax audit, but I've certainly had a VAT audit. Yeah. Back in the day when I was VAT registered, I've been through personal tax audits of, um, several times, uh, just spot checks, see things happen. And typically the way the audits will work is that they will send you a list of very scary questions. And as long as you can answer those questions relatively quickly, yeah. then the audit will be over and done with. Um, bef- well, it does still seem to drag on forever. Yeah, it does. But it's, it's at the point where you start giving very vague responses to things that they start digging into things yeah. in more detail. Yeah. So if you've got nothing to hide, then an audit is nothing to worry about. Mm. But they will, you know, for example, they'll send a thing saying, send me a copy of every receipt for every purchase over £250 in a given time frame. So if you've got everything in a spreadsheet, you can literally go onto the column, um, filter by date, filter by amount yeah. and list out all the receipt numbers of everything over a certain amount, scan them all in, send them to HMRC, and uh, they're happy. I mean, that that's just one example for uh, of the sort of thing that you might be asked to do in at audit time. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I just log everything in a spreadsheet, and I haven't found a better way of doing it. I don't use any accounting software. Uh, for the few invoices I produce, I just do them on a spreadsheet as well. 
just I do my invoicing just through Excel. What, what I found actually when I moved to this uh, invoicing package, it's called QuickSale, and like all these things, it's much more designed for uh, people who sell products. So you have stock items and all that sort of stuff, and you have to put each of the things that you make in as a as a product. So I had to have you know a floating shelf, a long floating shelf, uh, uh, an alcove cabinet. Alcove shelves, three floating shelves in an alcove. They all had to go. But once you've done that, and this is why I want to get the data out of there, it actually makes building an estimate really quick, really easy, because you've got sort of standard prices for things. Obviously, the standard price is just a starting point. Before I had this invoicing system in place, what I would do was you'd almost start afresh every time uh, trying to trying to build a, build a quote for somebody. By having the standardizing on fixed prices like this or, or standard prices uh, it made it much easier uh, to start putting things together like this and again if you're starting out it's probably quite hard to figure out what those prices should be and it gets easier the more work you do but it's uh, it's definitely i definitely recommend even if it's just in a spreadsheet have a think about the sort of time and effort you're going to spend on an alcove unit and get a get a stock price in mind for that complete job with an option to paint, including fitting and all, and all the rest of it, because it'll make building quotes, building estimates that much quicker. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's, there's definite advantages to going down the route of having dedicated software, but it just it all depends on how complicated your business structure is. And, yes, absolutely. And all that. At the end of the day, with with decent software... If you're using it correctly, you probably don't even need an accountant because it'll produce a tax return for you at the end, you know. But the 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 beauty of an accountant is that they keep up to speed with all the new rules and regs. And exactly, they they know they know what they can claim for and what they can't because they they obviously have. Yeah, you know, this is all they do. They have vastly more experience of this kind of things than than we. Uh, can ever well i was going to say hope to i would never hope to have experience of that sort of thing uh would ever need yeah, to exactly um, but yeah. so this question originally came in from chris uh via our contact uh contact at measuring up podcast.com so thanks chris for getting in touch great question yeah. i know chris uh, uh, uh hi chris here chris runs sharp edge woodworking uh the youtube channel is um uh is great we had a we had a good uh, a good chat about a year or so ago uh, we came and had a little a little interview which unfortunately uh didn't see the light of day, but we had a we had a good natter. Chris is a, a really nice guy, and uh, is is in the process of setting up his uh, uh, his sort of joinery and carpentry business, trying to trying to do similar sort of things as we do. Fantastic! So it's a perfect person for asking this kind of question. Really, you know, he's at that early stage of just trying to get his his um, an understanding of how things should work. One of the things that he asked was, "What do you do when you're paid in cash? Mm. You've logged the job, you've accepted the quote." The deposit might have been transferred electronically, but then the balance is given to you in cash on delivery. And the answer is very simple. You bank it. Yep. Every time. You bank it. Because as soon as you start spending that cash beforehand, uh, things start to get complicated because you're then going to have to try and log, okay, you've received that cash, but you've spent it on something else. Um if when you go, uh, if you get audited by HMRC, one of the things that they might ask is a list of every job you've done for a, a, um, over a period of time, and they'll go through that job list and they'll tally it up to your bank account, and they'll will literally go through every single job you've told them about, and they'll say, okay, here's, and they'll reconcile it against your bank your your bank statements. Yeah. And they will look for bits that are missing and they will start to ask questions. And that's the sort of thing that you don't, even though it might be perfectly above board and you've spent that money on new materials or whatever. Yep. You've got to show where those funds come from. Exactly. So you can avoid all that by just banking it and taking the money back out. It, it sounds stupid that it, even if you're going to bank it and then go to a cash machine and take the same amount back out to pay for something. Yeah. And, and if, if you do run a business bank account, that will actually cost you money as well because they yeah. charge you for, for cash deposits, which is annoying. I don't take checks now for that reason because checks became too much of a pain to deal with. Right. Um, I couldn't even take them to a branch. I had to post them off to a clearing centre and pay per check. And yeah. I, I haven't been paid by check for... Years, 
Yeah, I, I just don't do it. I, I haven't had anything but a transfer for years, to be honest. Transfer, uh, the odd bit of cash for smaller jobs um, and credit card machine. Uh, and the credit card machine is effectively a transfer because it just means it's a credit card machine putting the money straight into your bank in, instead of the instead of the customer. Yeah, sure. But yeah, um, that's what you do with cash. Get, get it banked. Yeah, bank it, raise an, in, raise an in, invoice for it and bank it. If the customer doesn't want the invoice, if they've made it clear, then you don't have to give it to them, but you've got to raise it. You've got to show where that cash has come from. Yeah, kind of. I mean, uh, uh, you don't have to raise a physical invoice um, as long as you've got that listed as a line on a spreadsheet to say you've done yeah. that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. piece of work. Um, so, you'd, But it's it's up to you, if, and especially if you're using a particular type of finance software, it will probably create the invoice anyway, even if you're not doing anything exactly, with it. Exactly, exactly. But yeah. if, if you don't have any need to give the invoice to the customer, um, as far as I'm aware anyway, you don't have to physically make an invoice or have a copy of an invoice that you're not giving to anyone. Again, if you're using an invoicing software package, then you will just because to get the numbering sequential and all that sort of yeah. stuff. So yeah, you know, I, I would do it as a matter of course. And again, you are obliged to keep printed records of this stuff as well. So uh, I, I would do it as a, as a matter of course, print it out, stick it in a folder. And- yeah. Um, it can all be digital now. It doesn't have to be printed anymore. Um, I, that, I can't remember when that changed, but I, I did look into that because um, that came up on a, a particular issue that I was having. Oh, okay. And you can now keep digital records of everything, and when it comes to an audit, you can send them digital records. You don't have to send them printed records anymore. Um, but there are areas of HMRC uh, separate to the the income tax side of things mm. and separate to self-assessment where they don't accept digital records. Yes, okay. So you have to bear that in mind. So And maybe corporation tax is different again. So, uh, yeah, the, this is again where an accountant comes into their own and they, they can ac- explain all of that. Because they keep up to date on these very exciting mm. rules and regs. They do indeed, as, as they should, because it's their job, not ours. Um, so, yeah, there we are. Interesting, interesting. So, so yeah, so and and I'm effectively empl- employed by my limited company, right? And I'm also self-employed because my YouTube and and that's coming off the back of when I used to teach drums and all that sort of thing because my drum teaching was purely just self-employed. Okay, and um, so I was doing a self-assessment tax return anyway for that, and then that's kind of evolved into becoming the media and YouTube side of things, which is on a at the moment on a self-employed basis. We'll, we'll soon become a PLC, I'm sure, Andy, with the uh, your successful videos of, uh, of uh, your small business toolbox, you know. So there we go. Um, in a nutshell, keep good records. Um, get, a, get an accountant. Get a good accountant. Um, and just, you know, prepare yourself for the sort of things that, you know, if you were the HMRC, what questions would you ask you? <laughs> you know, it, it's fairly logical, the sort of stuff that they ask at the point of audit, if that does happen. An audit's a horrible experience to go through, but if, as long as you've kept good records yes. um, and you can pretty much prove everything, uh, or certainly everything for any major transactions, then you should be fine. Um, one thing I don't do at the minute, which I'm intrigued uh, about, um, is I don't split out my costs on a per job basis. No. D- do you do that? So can you, if, and HMRC have never asked me to do this, but I have heard of this in other industries where if they have a certain expense, they want an invoice, they want to know what job that expense is tied to. That's almost impossible. You buy a pot of glue and it's used over 20 different jobs. Exactly, exactly. But I have heard of that happening more for big, big transactions where maybe you've bought £100,000 worth of certain materials and then that's offset against a million-pound job or something. Right. Then sometimes, and I don't know what the cut-off is for that, um, and maybe our listeners can clarify that if, if they know in a bit more detail mm-hmm. um but i've always wondered um where the cutoff is for having to split your costs um to or, or kind of log your costs to the degree of what job they were were originally against 
Um, as I say, I, I don't do that. But it's always been a back of my mind thing. Are HMRC ever going to say, "Well, what was that piece of wood used for?" You know. <laughs> oh, well, I had, I had three sheets of MDF that day, and they were used for all kinds of different things. You know, I can't you can't possibly uh, literally account for that, can you? Uh, it raises an interesting question, actually. How do you account for things like, well, consumables, stuff like glue? Yeah, uh, do you just treat that as part of your day rate? Do you do you add a consumables charge into a into an estimate? Um, uh, I kind of add on a little bit depending on the job. Um, but the consumables are normally so nominal in the in the scheme of things. You know, may, maybe adding ten or twenty quid here or there just to cover glue and nails. Um, but it does all add up. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that, well, that's the thing. That's why I questioned because I'm sort of scrambling around in the workshop, and you know, you, you asked about hoarding uh, in the last episode, and uh, I've got so many little bits and pieces tucked away in drawers and things over there, which have been bought for jobs but not used, and they've been billed for in the general sort of consumables or whatever. And I've got them, and you think, well, will I ever use them again? And it's hard to know what to do with them, really, because you know technically they've been bought for a job and and built against that job. Do you do you, if you charge somebody for them again, is that fraud? I mean, <laughs> it's, I don't know. If you well, no, so I mean, you can they're yours and part of the business. You can sell them, um, and you would have to account for that sale because it, they're owned by by the business and they were paid for by the business and you've already offset tax against them. Mm. So anything that you've offset tax and, and claimed tax relief for, if you sell it, you're going to have to declare that income. Um, you could argue whether anyone would ever know that that even exists. But, well, yeah. you know, if you decided to sell it through your own personal eBay account, apparently there's ways and means now that PayPal link directly into HMRC and feed them with information. Um, and... You know, is it worth the risk for the sake of a few quid? Yeah, yeah, probably not. Yeah, I, I'm just curious. You know, again, I've, I've got drawers of this stuff that I just you know, don't quite know what to do with, and it seems a shame to bin it. But uh, one option might be to find a a, a smaller company or a, a startup or something who might be able to make use of it and just give them it. You know, if if it's taking up space, and the alternative is it going to the tip. Yeah, I suppose so. Maybe try and find a young a younger company who are looking to get on their feet and maybe they could make use of it. I, I don't know. I, I'm the same. I've got yeah, crates and crates of stuff. Again, do, do, do you want to give somebody a whole load of old tat, you know? <laughs> will they Will they really yeah. want it or will they just take it for it's, being it's polite? tricky. So we need to say thank you to a few people, don't we? Uh, we certainly do. And actually, you got a Where I'm Listening From one that was very interesting. I did. I did. Actually, yes, that's a great one. Uh, we've, we've asked people to let us know where they're listening from. And this one was sent to me personally. Uh, and it's from Peter Titterton. Peter said that we could uh, use his name. Uh, and he wrote to me. He said, I just wanted to say thanks for your podcast. It's a pleasure. Uh, I watch your YouTube stuff, but downloaded some podcasts, little realising that I would listen to them in the acute coronary care unit after a mild heart attack and then a stent procedure. Uh, both of you helped distract me somewhat, so pass on my thanks to your co-host, uh, which is pretty, pretty. Uh, I think if we're playing top trumps on uh, the best places to listen to our podcast from, I think Peter did it and has, has just won there. Peter, I hope you are well, and I hope you're recovering. We had a little bit of back and forth, and uh, he sent me a follow-up email to say, Hi, Peter, arrived home today and can start the road to recovery with a bonus of your new series of podcasts to listen to in a less stressful environment. Isn't that so, awesome? Uh, Thank you very much indeed. We, we yeah, we that that's great. I'd like to point out that our podcasts were no way involved in uh, the <laughs> causing of that heart attack. But uh, no, that that's wasn't uh, the GDPR. I one, don't think it? it was. No, don't think it was. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So thanks, Peter, for letting us know about that. That's a, that's a great one. I need to say a quick shout out and thank you to our Patreon supporters, our awesome Patreon supporters. Uh, I'll start with my top of the list. Uh, let's say thank you to Douglas Deal, to Thistledo, to Brendan from the Shades Workshop, to Tim Bowers, Adrian Millington, to Chris Davidson, hi Chris, to Paul Gardner, Eddie Carroll, James Hewitt, Carl Panny, hi Carl, and to Steve Avery. And I will say a big thank you and massive shout out to Peter Tone, 
Owen Bullock, Tony Carnell, Adam Padley, Christopher Mark Duthie, Max Vietz, Mark Duff, Ben Harker, Harry Kappa, John Lynch and Duncan. Excellent. Of course, uh, once again, we'd like to thank Ooznest for their support of this show. And just to remind our listeners to use the code MEASUREUP at checkout to qualify for a 5% discount off your first order. Awesome stuff. And remember, we've got the after show coming up for everyone who supports us on Patreon. So you can get over to patreon.com slash measuring up podcast if you want to have a listen to the after show where we're going to be chatting about our top YouTube comments once again. Uh, so yes, as always, thank you to our awesome listeners for listening to the podcast. Uh, please take the time if you can to rate us and review us on iTunes. You can support the show at patreon.com measuring up podcast. Uh, you can follow both of us. I am 10 minute workshop uh, on YouTube. Andy, you are. I am Gosforth Handyman on YouTube, uh, Gosforth Andy on Twitter and uh, Gosforth Handyman on Instagram. Uh, Instagram for me is at 10 minute workshop and at 10 minute shop for the Twitters. Uh, feedback, of course, always welcome at measuring up PC on Twitter or at measuring up podcast on Instagram. And as mentioned earlier, if you'd like to email us directly, then contact at measuring up podcast.com is the best way to reach us. See you in the very, very secret after show. See you next time. Take care.